Today I'm going to be reviewing Silver Linings Playbook, the book by Matthew Quick. Now Matthew Quick has been sort of one of my comfort authors for a while, for years now. I've read Forgive Me Leonard Peacock probably at least five times by now. I've read The Reason You're Alive probably at least three times. Sort of like a rock star, I think twice, but this is only the second time I'm reading Silver Linings Playbook. Reason being, back when I first picked up Matthew Quick, this one didn't, didn't sort of click with me in the way that Leonard Peacock did. But years later, finally getting to this one. I do have a deeper appreciation for it. And besides, it's plain to see why this is the one that got the hit movie. Sort of Like a Rockstar, of course, also did get a Netflix movie, but that one wasn't nearly as popular. Silver Linings Playbook is what Matthew Quick is known for. That's because this one has a real tragic romance story, not just a teen romance like in Altogether Now. Sort of Like a Rockstar, that's the, the name of the movie that goes along with a Sort of Like a Rockstar book. Don't know why they changed the name of the movie to make it different from the book. But anyway, I think this is just a story and a character that grabs people more. And one more thing before I get into this, the thing that I really admire about Matthew Quick's writing, he has a skill that is taking a character that, at first glance, someone that society would not like or relate to at all, someone that society would probably even hate, he has a skill in humanizing that type of character and making it into somebody that the reader relates to, sympathizes with, someone that the reader can even root for. In Leonard Peacock, we see a high school kid that's planning a murder-suicide in The Reason You're Alive. It's written from the point of view of the sort of grizzled, rough-around-the-edges, bigoted Vietnam War veteran, that type of stereotype. Sort of like a rock star breaks that mold a little bit. But this book, this is one of Quick's older books, Sort of Like a Rock Star is, I think, the newest one, if I remember right. This book focuses on a character that we first meet from his point of view in a mental hospital. His mother picks him up from the hospital, checks him out, takes him to live at home and take care of him at home. And then throughout the book, we get one hint after another, like bits and pieces of information about his old life. First piece of information we get, he has a wife named Nikki, and they're currently having away time from each other. In other words, she told him that she wants time on her own to think about some things. It's pretty obvious to the reader right away that Nikki left him, you know, that the joke comes to mind about the dad who went to buy milk six years ago and never came back, that sort of situation. But this protagonist, Pat Peebles, is just so optimistic that if he works on himself enough, if he does enough self improvement, if he's able to change all the things that she didn't like about him, then eventually, quote-unquote, away time will be over, and they'll be reunited as a happy man and wife. So he gets picked up from that mental hospital by his mom. We see him struggling to get oriented at home again. He used to be a sports coach at a high school. He's currently unemployed. He thinks he only spent a couple months in the mental hospital. He finds out, to his shock, that the amount of time was actually four years. And it actually takes a good length of the book before he comes to grip with the amount of time that he missed. He starts meeting with a therapist. Therapist puts him on medication. We're not really sure exactly what each pill does. The reader is not sure, in other words. But we get enough hints that anger issues are part of the problem. Which is strange because we see this character as being one of the most gentle characters you can imagine. Doesn't want to hurt a fly. I'll get into that more later. One other thing that Pat is obsessed with is working out. He wants to get more muscular. He wants to take fitness to the extreme because he thinks Nikki will like a man with a toned body. And the other thing, he is an endless optimist. He doesn't like books with sad endings. He doesn't like people who assume his life will have a sad ending. In other words, people who try to encourage him to get over Nikki because they tell him she's never coming back. He doesn't believe them. Endless amount of optimism for that reunion. And another way we sort of see him disoriented about coming back to his home life, or rather his parents' home, is he's told at one point that one of the side effects, the potential side effects of one of the pills he's taking is hallucinating. So, tell your mom if you ever see something that you think might not be real. Well, his family are huge Eagles football fans, so he comes back home, and he realizes that in the time he was gone, he wasn't even aware what was happening in the outside world when he was in the mental hospital. So he comes back, and his brother shows him a video of Veterans Stadium being demolished. So right away, he runs, he finds his mom. Hey mom, uh, I think I saw something that wasn't there. I think I just saw the football stadium getting demolished. Which, of course, that did actually happen in real life. Pat is not allowed to drive, however, he does live walking distance from one of his old friends named Ronnie. Ronnie is, of course, married now, and he has a toddler that Pat has never met. Ronnie invites him over to a welcome home dinner party, and he, inv and he also invites his wife's sister, Tiffany. Tiffany, who we learn, has a husband who died, so the implication there is sort of setting them up on a date. Pat, however, is oblivious to the fact that he's being set up on a date. He thinks he's just being friendly, 
And of course, he is completely loyal to his ex-wife. He believes 100% that he's gonna be reunited with Nikki. So at the end of the dinner, Tiffany asks him to walk her home. She, of course, also lives in the same neighborhood, also walking distance from Pat. And we learn she also lives with her parents. She lives in basically like an in-law addition to the house that they have in the backyard. And at the end of the walk home, Tiffany invites him inside and pretty bluntly offers to have sex with him. He, of course, refuses. He's loyal to Nikki. And Tiffany ends up crying on his shirt. But after that day, of course, Pat does a daily run every day. I think he does 10 or 15 miles every morning. And every day on his regular run, he starts seeing Tiffany, ready, waiting for him. As soon as she sees him, no words, she just starts jogging behind him, following him on his daily run. And he describes trying to go on all these challenging routes, trying to run longer and faster than her, but she just keeps up with him. Every day, jogging, no words. And then finally, the thing he decides to do after talking to a few people for advice is he gets it in his head that if she gets what she's chasing, which he thinks is a date with him, then she might finally leave him alone. So he borrows money from mom. He asks her on a date. They go to this diner in the local area. She orders nothing. He orders a bowl of cereal. They share the bowl of cereal. The bill is like $3. He leaves 40 bucks. Keep the change. And then he walks her home again. There's a scene a little later where we see Ronnie talking to Pat. Ronnie tries to warn Pat that Tiffany is weird, tells him that she got fired from her job. Ronnie tells him why, but the reader actually never hears the reason why, at least not directly. Pat, though, sort of takes it the wrong way when Ronnie uses the word weird. Why is she weird? Because she's in therapy? Because she's on medication? I'm in therapy. I'm on medication. So we have one of those awkward moments, sort of, and Pat ends up just writing it off as Ronnie not understanding. Now, back at home, we have a little bit of tension of how the father views Pat, and some potential minor confusion for anyone listening because the father is Pat Sr., so for most of the time, I'm probably just going to refer to him as Pat's father. The father seems to be sort of disappointed that he has a son that had to be in a mental hospital for so long, and now he's living at home without a job, mooching off his parents. But we don't really see that expressed in words, rather. The father is a quiet person, reserved, cares about Eagles football, but doesn't really seem to care about much else. Game day is pretty much the only day where we see him come alive. But with a a lot of pushing from mom, dad actually does break the silence with Pat by offering to leave the sports section of the newspaper. At the top of the stairs, of course, Pat's home gym system, his, all his equipment for working out is in the basement. So at the top of the stairs to the basement, the father tells Pat, every morning when I'm done reading the sports section, usually I take it to work and read it at work. Pat remembers when they were kids, they would all be, like, excited trying to ask dad for the sports section so they could read it too, but he always took it to work. Well, this time, the father gets up early, reads it in the morning at breakfast, and then leaves the sports section for Pat to read. So that is seen as sort of an opening up gesture. Progress, sort of, maybe. Meanwhile, Ronnie and his wife Veronica are planning a beach trip for them, the toddler, Pat, and Tiffany. Pat and Tiffany are sort of uncomfortable during the car ride because there's too much talking. Shortly after they get to the beach, Tiffany ends up storming off angry because Veronica accidentally mentions something about Tiffany's therapist, and Tiffany's embarrassed that Pat hears that she has a therapist, even though Pat already knew, but she didn't know that. So the two women go off to talk feelings. Pat and Ronnie have the kid on the beach. They relax for a while, Ronnie falls asleep, and then Pat gets the idea he's gonna go take the kid swimming in the waves. Which is fine, nothing dangerous happens, but as soon as Veronica comes back, she freaks out. You would think a shark was about to eat the baby. Runs into the water, takes the baby out of the water, yelling at the husband for leaving the baby alone with Pat, acting like being alone with Pat is the most dangerous thing that possibly could have happened, and of course Pat is right there listening to this, and one of the things he does when he has overwhelming emotions is he just runs. So he just starts running along the beach, and what do you know, Tiffany follows him, still running along the beach with him. No words, just running for a long time. They eventually double back, they run back, they end up swimming in the waves together, and then they ask to go home early. Meanwhile, did I mention the family are huge Eagles fans? Pat's brother is a season ticket holder to the Eagles football games. He invites Pat to go to a game with him. They end up tailgating with some of his brother's friends before the game. His brother's friends are, of course, also super 
super fans. To the extent that they have a whole tent set up with a generator and a satellite so they can watch TV in the parking lot. They see game coverage while tailgating while waiting for the game to start. Now, at this game, there was a bit of an altercation. There was somebody coming to the game wearing the other team's jersey. This somebody also had a young kid with him. Now, of course, it's a football game. Everyone's rowdy, drinking beer. You're at the other team's stadium wearing your team's shirt. Of course, something's gonna happen. What happens is a crowd of people start walking up to him, chanting, asshole, asshole. Pat's brother and his friends are part of this crowd, and so Pat sort of gets swept along with it. But then the kid starts, like, clutching his father's leg and crying. The crowd sees this, and they sort of disperse, but the father, a minute later, walks up to Pat and his brother. What, are you proud of what you did? You made a kid cry. Pushes the brother, trying to, like, pick a fight. Ends up throwing the brother down on the ground and pushing Pat, trying to provoke a fight. Pat, who spends hours working out every day, punches the dude. The dude is knocked out cold on the ground. But Pat, though, is, like, horrified about what he's done. And so, when he feels overwhelming emotions, he just runs. And he ends up getting lost in Philly. His brother's friends eventually find him, though. And they're all excited that he won that fight. They all congratulate him and everything. He, of course, doesn't feel like it's something worth congratulating. He still feels intense guilt because of that. But the brother takes him into the stadium to get seats for the game. And they're able to see the game in peace. Pat still feels guilty about it after the event. Ends up having nightmares about it, including one nightmare where his ex-wife is on the ground comforting the guy that got knocked out. And she gives a dirty look to Pat in the dream, of course. His brother and his friends tell him it's nothing to worry about. His therapist tells him that the Giants fan basically deserved it. He opens up to Tiffany, and she says she doesn't know why he feels guilty about that. But then, while he's opening up to Tiffany, they're sitting at that diner again, having their regular bowl of cereal. We see Tiffany sort of push at a sensitive spot. Pat says something along the lines that Nikki won't like that I used violence. Tiffany just comes out bluntly and says it, fuck Nikki. Tells him she wasn't there for him when he was in the mental hospital. She never visited, never wrote him letters. She's not here for him now. Fuck Nikki. But of course, the message doesn't sink in for Pat. He is still absolutely insistent that this is going to have a happy ending. The movie of his life is going to have a happy ending. Throughout the book, he says that his life is his own movie. And for a long time in the first part of the book, he commits to not watching movies anymore because the only movie he wants to watch is his own life. He's that committed to improving himself so Nikki likes him again. Back at home, Pat is able to hear arguments in the other room that his parents are stressed about money. He's aware enough to realize that he's being a burden on his parents, him living at home. He starts feeling really guilty for that. And eventually it becomes obvious that mom is not really happy with the way things are going at home. The father is aloof all the time. They're having fights. The father's not appreciative of his son. They're not having family time. Mom puts a lot of effort into cleaning and doesn't really get much from him out of it. And we see one day where mom just like snaps and comes home drunk in the middle of the night. Misses giving Pat his nightly pills and then she's hung over the next morning. Misses giving Pat his morning pills. He has to figure out by himself by remembering the color and the shape of each pill that he's supposed to take at each time. We see Pat cleaning up after Dad when he and Dad are alone on game day. We see Pat giving his mother Tylenol and water when she's hungover. And then, while he's cleaning up after Dad, he finds a crumpled up piece of paper on the floor, so he opens and reads it. It's a note from Mom to Dad. Basically an ultimatum. Either you return the big, expensive, flat-screen, surround-sound TV that you got that we can't afford, or you do X, Y, and Z, spend this amount of time with me and Pat, do this amount amount of family stuff every week, eat dinner with us this many times a week, otherwise I'm going on strike, I'm not cooking or cleaning, and I'm not sleeping in the same bed with you. So now Pat has to deal with not liking a dirty house, but his mother telling him not to clean because his dad needs to feel the pressure, his parents having that disagreement at home, home being a less peaceful place than it used to be, and on top of it all, by accident, Pat finds a box in the attic with his name on it. He opens the box up, and what do you think is inside? All of the old pictures pictures of him with his ex-wife. Pictures that his mom said were stolen in a burglary. He stays quiet about that for now. He doesn't tell mom that he finds it. Pat then goes to visit his brother in Philadelphia. His parents live in one of the suburbs outside the city, and then his brother lives in a big, fancy apartment in the city. While he's there, his brother breaks the news to him that he does have a wife now. He offers to take Pat to go have lunch with the wife. So they go meet her, and they seem like a pretty happy couple. And then, it's on a Tuesday when this happens. They were planning to go see an eagle game during a weekday. And when they get to the train station, it occurs to Pat that his brother is free to go to a game on a weekday. What does his brother do for work that allows this? And then he realizes he doesn't even know what his brother does for work. So they have that conversation. Turns out his
his brother trades stocks, and his wife plays piano for an orchestra. So then they go to the game, and they have a nice day. And then later on, after this, there's a scene where he's talking to his mom at home. And his mom acted, like, worried when Pat asked about his brother's wife, like, that's something he wasn't supposed to know because they couldn't predict how he would react to it. I like how smoothly the author worked in just, like, people's reactions to Pat, people treating Pat differently because they know he's a mental patient. And writing that from Pat's point of view, I think it did a good job of making the character feel, like, misunderstood, I think is a good word for it. And then there's a scene shortly after this where Pat does spill the beans to his mom that he knows about the pictures, the Pat box. The box also had his wedding video in it. So after he tells mom that, he actually puts some of the pictures back up on display. And the way he rationalizes this is he just thinks the parents hate Nikki. He thinks that's the only reason that the pictures were hidden. And then we start to get to the interesting parts of the book, Tiffany. One day, out of the blue, she hands him a letter. She tells him not to open it until he's in a good mood. He has to wait at least a certain amount of time before he opens the letter. And then after he opens the letter, he's supposed to come back and talk to Tiffany within a certain amount of time. So he takes the letter, he doesn't open it right away. Meanwhile, mom and dad make up. Time passes, Pat opens the letter. The letter says that Nikki divorced him and pulled out a restraining order on him. Also says that Nikki got his house and everything in the divorce. However, according to the letter, according to Tiffany, she says she managed to get Nikki's phone number and she's willing to read letters from Pat to Nikki over the phone and in turn Nikki will read to Tiffany what she wants her to write down in a letter back to Pat. The letter says that Nikki is willing to do this, however, there's a catch. The condition for this is Pat has to agree to be Tiffany's dance partner in a dance competition that's coming up. They have to practice an intense amount of time every day. And during the practice time, it'll be a whole three weeks, so three whole games, Pat is not allowed to talk about Eagles, watch an Eagles game, go to an Eagles game, nothing. No sports, no football at all, only training. So after Pat reads the letter, he goes to Tiffany's place and he tells her he agrees. He will be her dance partner. Next comes up what Pat calls the movie montage, which is, like I said, Pat training hours and hours every day this dance routine with Tiffany. And it like speeds through just quick glimpses of this part of the dance or that part of the dance and side by side with this friend or that friend or this family or that family. Pat, why won't you watch the Eagles with us? Pat, why won't you even talk about the Eagles? And he just puts his fingers in his ears. La 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 la. Pat, you cursed the team by not coming to this game, by not watching the game. People, like, begging him to get back into football again because they think he cursed the team. They haven't won a game for as long as Pat has been ignoring the games. Meanwhile, Pat is begging everyone he can find to come to the dance competition because, Tiffany says, all the applause from the audience is likely to factor into the judge's decision when they hand out the first place prize. And he keeps giving hints, I might be allowed to partake in this shared interest again if I win the competition. But but he doesn't, like, directly say it. Funny, funny. Anyway, the dance performance happens. More people than he ever expected come to cheer on Pat and Tiffany in their dance. Pat figures out it's not actually a competition. Tiffany just has this weird thing about wanting to do a super amazing job at this one dance performance, even though most of the other contestants are teenagers. But I guess compared to Pat, it's not that weird. Pat has the thing about the Eagles and working out, and Tiffany has this thing about dancing, okay? But anyway, they do knock it out of the park with their performance, and Tiffany agrees to be that go-between between Pat and Nikki. And meanwhile, nobody, not even Pat's therapist, knows about this agreement. Nobody suspects that Nikki is back in Pat's life. So straight after the dance performance, a bunch of Pat's football friends load him onto a football bus. They go straight directly to a game, and the Eagles win, and the curse is broken. Now, it's after this we get to see some of the letters back and forth between Pat and Nikki. Pat is aware of the possibility that Tiffany was lying about this whole thing just to get him to dance. Even back before all that dance practice, he was aware of that, but he thought the possibility that it's real was too good to pass up, so he went through with it anyway. In the letters, we see Pat repeatedly talking about silver linings and happy endings and being an optimist, and asking, pleading, begging, one chance, just one chance, will you meet with me just this once? I read all these books for you, I made all these changes for you, I started dancing now. Meanwhile, Nikki 
politely says that she's remarried, she loves her new husband very much, she just wants closure. Which Pat, even me as a reader, I was a little bit concerned that Pat would just snap and fly off the handle at the part about Nikki being remarried, but he didn't. He took it sort of okay, but he did continue in his delusion that he still has a chance with her or at least to see her. Pat writes these long letters talking about the things they did in the past, the one vacation they took to Cape Cod, all these happy memories about them as a couple. We can go to Cape Cod again, we can do this, we can do that. Nikki writes, quote, I can see clearly we are not moving towards closure, which makes me regret opening up this dialogue, unquote. Pat finally writes and asks her to meet him Christmas Day at dusk at the place where he proposed to her. Nikki sends back a letter, makes it absolutely clear she's not going, but Pat still decides that he's gonna go anyway, just in case. Quote, If I have faith, if I go to that special place, something beautiful will happen when the sun sets. I can feel it. End quote. Convinces himself that if there's ever a time for a miracle, Christmas Day would be it. So we see Christmas afternoon, Pat leaves the house, starts walking, gets public transit, gets off at Olney Bus Station on North Broad Street. Philly locals will know which one I mean. The sun is setting, Pat goes to the back of this one tea place, and Nikki is not there, so he waits. He waits longer, he knows he's a little early, he waits a little longer, the sun is set pretty much, but she might come late, who knows, he waits a little longer, he's okay if she comes late just as long as he gets to see her. He closes his eyes and he thinks for a long time, and he decides, when I open my eyes, she's gonna be there, and when he opens his eyes, Tiffany is there. Tiffany reveals that she was lying about the entire letter thing, but however, she did look up how Nikki is doing, and everything she said about Nikki's life is true, Nikki is remarried, she does have kids now, in fact. There was a crime involved that Pat does does not remember, and that led to the divorce and Pat's incarceration, I guess that's a good word for it, in a mental hospital, not an actual prison. And of course the restraining order is also true. And Pat finally, finally realizes that Nikki is never coming back. Tiffany confesses her love for Pat. Pat starts running. He runs, and he runs, and he ends up running faster than Tiffany and losing track of her on purpose. And he keeps running a little further, and someone sticks their leg out and trips him. And because this is North Broad Street in Philadelphia, a group of multiple guys start beating him up on the ground, and they mug him, and they take a bunch of his stuff. So he's bloody, he's injured, he's walking slow. He doesn't know where he is in North Philly. He sees a place with a yard nativity scene of Black Mary, Black Joseph, and Black Baby Jesus. So he goes into that yard, and he starts just having a moment looking at Black Baby Jesus. And the door opens, and in one of those wonderful coincidences, call it a Christmas miracle, it is one of his friends from the mental asylum. That friend, Donnie, happened to have gotten home that exact day. That is his aunt's house. So Donnie takes him inside, they chat for a little bit, they catch up, and then the aunt comes in and sees how bloody Pat is, and immediately she sends him to the hospital. He is able to make a phone call to his family, and then he realizes, after he ran away, Tiffany also called his family and told them that he is lost in North Philly after dark on North Broad and Olney. So the family ends up missing a Christmas Day game, one of the most important games of the season. Missing that because they had to go drive around North Philadelphia aimlessly looking for Pat, and Pat feels really guilty about that. Turns out Pat broke a bone, he has to wear a cast, but after he recovers and gets home, we see a scene late at night when the rest of the family is asleep where Pat decides he's gonna plug in his old wedding video of Nikki, and he's gonna watch that. So he plugs it in, he starts watching the video, and then it gets to the part where they have their first dance, and if you'll remember, actually I, I really hope I said this detail sooner in the book review, I honestly forget if I did, but but Pat throughout the whole book has had a violent dislike of Kenny G, and now we find out why. Kenny G was the first dance at their wedding, but also Pat has a flashback and we have a big reveal moment. Kenny G is the song that was playing when Pat came home early one day and caught Nikki in bed with someone else. Or rather, in the shower with someone else. And we see Pat remember everything about how he almost choked the guy to death. And the only reason he stopped was because Nikki hit him over 
of the head with a hard object. He has that memory now. Meanwhile, now that Pat's home, now that the whole family knows that Tiffany lied to Pat about being in contact with Nikki and that resulted in Pat getting lost in North Philly, Pat's family and a lot of friends have a uh, dislike and mistrust of Tiffany now. However, Pat's mom does not share this dislike because Tiffany, before this event, had worked hard to get on the mom's good side. Pat's mom gives Pat a letter from Tiffany. Tiffany describes her dead husband and what happened there. There. Turns out Tiffany's husband was a cop. He was also a pretty big sex fiend. They had sex multiple times a day for years. And the gist of how he died was Tiffany one day said, Hey, honey, uh, maybe we should do this less often. Says something along the lines of, It would feel special to me again if we could wait longer in between when we do it. And the husband takes that to mean sex has stopped feeling special for her, and he gets hurt by that. And then, of course, as things happen, that day they had an argument happened to be the last time Tiffany saw her husband. What happened was the husband took his lunch break and he went to Victoria's Secret to buy lingerie in Tiffany's size. He was coming back from that in a place where he wouldn't have been if he didn't stop and take that detour at the mall. And because he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, he happened to have died on duty as a police officer. And Tiffany feels intense guilt because he wouldn't have been in that place had she not made him feel like sex was less special to her. So, for a very long period of time, she would have sex with lots and lots of random guys. She writes that she would just give a guy a certain look and she could know right away based on how they responded whether or not they would have sex with her. And she wrote that while they were on top of her, she would just close her eyes and imagine that it was her husband and that was the way that she would try to be with her husband again. And this type of activity was the reason that she got fired from her old job. But then, when she tried to do this with Pat, Pat surprised her by saying no, and that's when she broke down crying, and gradually she figured out that the type of friendship Pat offered was much better for her in the space that she was in than the kind of thing she tried to initiate with Pat on that first night. She thought it would be just friendship, but then she realized she started getting jealous when Pat talked about Nikki. And that's when we see that scene in the diner, Fuck Nikki. Tiffany begs Pat to forgive her and to be friends again. And then, the final scene of the book sees Pat and Tiffany meeting up in a park, and they have a really beautiful moment, really beautiful conversation, and they end up admitting that they both need each other. And they're able to bond with each other much better than anyone else would be because of their shared understanding of the sort of pain that they've each been through. Quote, Nikki would not have done this for me, not even on her best day, end quote. And that is where we get the happy ending to the book. Matthew Quick, as an author, is a big fan of a happy ending, but in this case, we'll call it a silver lining. Now, now, that's the end of the plot summary. I'll take a moment to shout out a uh, Julie Manning YouTube channel. That is the channel where I listen to this book in audio form. So thank you to her for reading this book to me. And now I'll give some general thoughts. I like how this one was sort of like, it, it felt halfway like a mystery book, like slowly unraveling the details of Pat's past life. From his point of view, of course, even though the reader could probably guess at least some of the details. Some of them were a surprise to me, though. The other thing I appreciate is Matthew Quick has a habit of setting his books in the Philadelphia area. Now, having spent time living in the Philly area, I can appreciate this because I know the places that he's talking about. I know the train stations that he mentions. I, of course, know North Broad Street and Olney Station. When he talks about Market Street, South Street, I know those areas. When he got off the bus at Olney, I knew exactly exactly what was coming at some point. Now, as for the message that I think the author wants us to get from this book, I think it's something like pain comes from nowhere, or at the very least life is unfair and gives us pain often that's not even our fault. Healing from that pain can sometimes take extreme amounts of time and effort, but healing and silver linings are always possible, as we've seen. The book is also about intensely broken people finding some kind of happiness together, and that's what I think the author would like the reader to take out of this book. And before I started doing these book reviews, that would probably have been the furthest I looked into it. And 
And I appreciate the way that I've started reviewing these books this way because it forces me to look even deeper, like that extra layer deeper to try and find even more meaning from it. I mentioned at the beginning of this video how many times I've read and reread certain Matthew Quick books, but this is the first time I'm really digging deep into the question of what are some beliefs that Matthew Quick has about life, the world, human nature, things that are fundamental enough beliefs for him, enough so that that they just come across, they, they're taken for granted as truth when we're reading his writing. I think Matthew Quick would say that pain is often not our fault. The world can just be a cruel place sometimes, and that's just how it is. But that doesn't mean violence is the answer, that doesn't mean we can't rise above it and heal from it. I'll contrast that line of thinking, though, with one of my other favorite authors, Solzhenitsyn. In his huge book, Gulag Archipelago, there's a scene in there where he's talking to a man who's sitting on a hospital bed. The man will be dead by the next morning. But the last words that the man spoke to him just stuck with him because it was the man's last words that he could remember. The man said something along the lines of, I have a theory that nothing bad happens to us that we don't deserve. And that line, that theory, comes to us around the same part of a book that talks about how being a prisoner in a gulag, even knowing that you're not guilty of the crime that they're accusing you of, so years of your life in one of the worst prisons on the planet, so much time I'm just sitting and thinking, and he writes that the human mind inevitably comes to something from the past that you've done wrong and you want to make amends for. And thinking about it, yeah, there are a lot of things in the past that I've done wrong and I want to make amends for. There are a lot of things that I still do wrong and I wish I could be better with. So if something bad happens to me just out of the blue, just random chance, this Solzhenitsyn theory would say that, why well, I may not have done anything to directly cause that bad thing to happen to me, but that doesn't mean I don't deserve it. And me personally, yeah, I've done enough bad things, that having something bad happen to me in life wouldn't be completely unjust. I still hope that bad things don't happen to me. I hope that bad things don't happen to anyone else. I hope that everyone can examine themselves and figure out things that they've done wrong in the past, things that they continue to do wrong, and people can try to admit that they've done wrong and make it better. This is like a game now. How much can I describe the process of Christian redemption without actually saying the word Jesus or God? But that's what it is, and that's how Solzhenitsyn described it. And that resonated with me, at least. But hey, you know how the saying goes. It's a B-list history book review. It's only a matter of time before God comes up. The other thing I think that Matthew Quick believes on a fundamental level that we can see reflected in his writing is, I think Matthew Quick would say, say that people are inherently good. And I base this on all of his characters, his protagonist, of course. We see misfits, we see people that society has thrown out, we see people doing things that society would judge them for, but we're reading the book from their point of view and we're meant to empathize with them. These people have very human emotions, very human motivations, and it often works out well that the reader doesn't judge them for what they're doing. I think Forgive Me Leonard Peacock is the most clear example of this, but so Overlining's playbook is also a good example, particularly an example of this fundamental belief that I think Matthew Quick has in action. The character Pat Peebles, even the character himself admits that he was a pretty bad husband in the past. One might wonder if he was a lot like his father, just aloof and not spending a lot of time with the family. And then Nikki, instead of doing what Pat's mom did, Nikki dealt with it by finding someone to have an affair with and then getting caught, and then after the divorce and the restraining order and everything, Nikki runs off and marries that other guy. But focusing on Pat again, we have this character that's a mental patient that has done bad things in the past that if you just heard them talked about secondhand, you might have a hard time liking this character. Or at the very least, you might have a hard time saying that you want to hang out with this character. But at the same time, as we gradually get more of Pat's backstory revealed, Pat's use of violence at the football game where that other team's fan pushed his brother, confronted Pat, you would have a hard time I'm finding someone who says that that punch was not justified. And then Pat choking out the guy that was in his house, in his shower, with his wife, you would find a hard time finding someone who says that that wasn't justified, or at the very least that they wouldn't do the same thing, or at the very least that they wouldn't root for someone who did that thing. So we have a complex character. It's not black or white whether this character is fully a good person, but the author, in the way that they write from this character's point of view, seems to be arguing that, yes, this character is a good person, this character is 
redeemable. This character does deserve a happy ending. Looking at some of the other books, too, Leonard Peacock. Spoiler alert, if you want to read Leonard Peacock, spoiler alert. The protagonist there was the victim of sexual abuse. That's the thing that drove him to do what he did. But at the same time, even that person's abuser, we learn later in the book, was the victim of abuse himself. And we see that person clearly dealing with emotional issues, having trouble coping with what happened to him. And even the person who abused the protagonist abuser, it's unclear whether that person was abused in the past. So again, we see this theme of people being inherently good, but they could be intensely hurt, they could be twisted by pain. Intense emotional issues caused by that kind of pain. In these books, that's when those characters start causing pain to others. So that's why I think Matthew Quick would say that people are inherently good. And now, just for fun, I'm gonna look for a few contrasting points of view. The one that most clearly stood out in my mind was Saul Alinsky. He's a famous political activist. He wrote that people usually do the right thing for the wrong reasons. In other words, when an elected official does the right thing, it's usually because people from that community got together and they successfully did some form of activism in a way that compelled, or rather incentivized, that elected official to do the right thing. So they're doing the right thing, it's not for a good reason, it's not because they're a good person, it's not because they have goodness in their heart, it's because it's beneficial to them. It might get them reelected. it might prevent some other kinds of problems caused by by unsatisfied people of their constituents. That's what Saul Alinsky believes. And another point of view, I already brought up Solzhenitsyn before, but a different part of his Gulag Archipelago book. He writes, the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. In other words, every single person has both good and evil inside of them. If you feed one, it grows. If you feed the other, it grows. And feeding one or the other works the way that it does because we're building habits. So you can justify an action in the moment, oh, it's just this one, so it's only for this reason, but then you can wake up a while later and realize you're not the person you wanted to be. I like to say every action, every second of every day contributes to either heaven or hell right here on Earth. And that feeling of waking up years later, realizing you're a person who does things that you don't like, that's not even hell for other people, that's hell for you. And the place in Solzhenitsyn's book that stood out to me the most, as an example of this, was at the end of the Kenjir prison revolt when that uprising was being put down. When the Soviet government came in and they started negotiating with the prisoners, Solzhenitsyn writes that it was like talking to people who spoke a different language. And now, of course, me. In the year 2016, I was a Trump supporter on a Philadelphia college campus. I know exactly what he means when he describes talking to people that, yeah, on paper they speak English, I speak English, yeah, on paper they speak Russian, he spoke Russian, but it's like talking to someone who speaks a completely different language. It's just, we don't share the same moral framework. On a fundamental level, we don't have the same idea of good and evil, right and wrong. But at the same time, I can see, I can see a potential alternate reality where I could have gone down that road. And I like to think there's a potential alternate reality where some of the people I used to be friends with before Trump became big in the news, I like to think there's an alternate reality somewhere where they could have gone down the same road as me. I will never know that answer. But that line again, about the line between good and evil running through through the heart of every man. People can do things that cause a lot of pain to others and think they're doing good by doing that. Now, of course, I would say that about people who hate me, hate Donald Trump, hold enough hate in their hearts that some people on that side would go as far as taking a rifle to a Trump rally and trying to kill him and shooting him through the ear. And I know for a fact that a lot of people on that side would say the same thing about me. They would say that the things I believe, the things I do, are causing pain to other people. We would both point at each other and say that's morally wrong, that's evil. So what's the right answer there? Who knows? Hopefully God sees the world like a Matthew Quick book where every single person has redeeming qualities. Where every single person is a protagonist worth rooting for. That's what I can hope for.